recording. And yeah, with that, I'd like to move on to the topic of today. So we're here today to hear more about the Open Book Collective, which was recently launched. Um, and we'll hear more from uh, two speakers here, from Joe DeVille. And Joe is a senior lecturer based jointly in the Department of Organization, Work and Technology and the Department of Sociology at the University of Lancaster. And he's also a co-investigator of the COPIN project and the principal investigator of uh, the recently announced Opening the Futures project, which will begin in May. And then together with Joe, the, uh, Judith is here. And Judith is the Outreach and Research Associate at the University of Lancaster. And she works on outreach and governance for the Open Book Collective uh, as part of the COPIM project. Um, and with that, I will hand it over now to, to Joe and Judith uh, yeah, to share a bit more about the uh, Open Book Collective and COPIM and anything else they'd like to share something about here. Okay, thank you so much, Tom, and, and hello, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, I realise that for many of us, this is kind of one of the final acts before the uh, the holiday weekend over the Easter period, and it certainly is here in the UK. Um, so, yes, um, I'm presenting it. Um, I mean, Joy, my colleague, was going to co-present with me, but um, she ha is on leave. I had to take some leave. Um, so she's unable to join today, so I'm going to present um, for both of us. Uh, and we also have Judith here, as um, Tom mentioned, uh, and both Judith and I can answer any questions that you might have um, around any of the issues that I address in my presentation. So without further ado, please do feel to put any questions in the chat, um, or of course, there'll be time at the end to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, hold them both me one second. Okay, um, so yes, hello everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, as I mentioned, um, as Tom uh, has already uh, alluded to, the Open Book Collective is one of the outputs of the COPIN project. Some of you may well uh, have come across the COPIN project before. It's a project um, co-funded by the Researching and Development Fund and the Arcadia Fund, um, and there are many different sort of parts to that project. Uh, the Open Book Collective is one part, a quite significant part, but there are others. There's the uh, Opening the Future Revenue Model, uh, which my colleague Tom Grady and Martin Eve have been working on. That's aimed at providing a new uh, business model for uh, university presses. Um, if you've got any questions about that, I can try my best to answer them. Another is the uh, Tote Open Metadata platform. I will be talking briefly about that um, today, but that is a platform that its aim is to make it far easier for uh, open access book publishers to manage their, ex their metadata and potentially to export it to a range of different places. And there's some quite interesting things you can do once metadata becomes open, as I will, uh, I will touch upon. There's other work under being undertaken as part of the coping project. We also have a work package, for example, around archiving and preservation. Um, so my colleague Miranda Barnes and Gareth Cole are working on that. But I today will be talking about the Open uh, Book Collective. Um, so the Open Book Collective, as um, Tom mentioned, was launched uh, at the very end of last year, um, and we've really just begun our outreach work in, in earnest in the past month, um, uh, and I'll come on to um, talk about what some of the games might be. But I think it's worth going back to where we began on this project and what we were sort of the context that we were perhaps uh, thinking about uh, and um, provides the context for the establishment of the Open Book Collective, and that is um, the prevalence within the open access book publishing world of book processing charges. I should say, as Tom did mention, I am a uh, one of the co-founders of a very small open access publisher called Mattering Press, very tiny, you can publish sort of, you know, between three and six books a year, so very, very small. Um, but as part of that press, you know, we have, uh, we still do uh, charge book processing charges in effect. We don't necessarily call them that, but that's our, that is what they are in effect, uh, where we can. They're not mandatory, but we, um, if an author has funds available to, to fund the, the cost publication, we, we do charge those. Um, and there are many, but there are many issues, I think, with um, book processing charges. Um, and that's one of the key, I guess, extant parts of the open access book publishing landscape that we were keen to tackle within the COPIN project. I think it's worth just kind of pulling out what the case against book, book, book processing charges might be before I get into any more details. So um, one of those, the obvious one, is that they're expensive, ranging between 10 and 11,000 pounds commonly for larger presses, but even for smaller uh, not-for-profit presses, they can still be considerable. So uh, within my 
uh, press, we have a uh, our, our fee, we say that it ranges between zero and six thousand pounds. So we can sometimes discount it up to 100 percent, but the top range is six thousand uh, pounds. Obviously, that is a fee that is unaffordable to many, uh, if not all of the vast majority of individual researchers, but also puts a high financial strain on institutions and grants, whether the, that income has to come from grants. One of the consequences is, uh, it, therefore, uh, to our mind, is, is an unequal way of funding uh, open access book publishing. It's likely to be accessible, uh, the funds available to fund book processing charges are likely to be accessible by researchers on large research grants, primarily, um, or occasionally, um, perhaps uh, uh, later career scholars in more secure academic positions. But there's also broader inequalities, um, irrespective of career position or whether you're on a grant or not, it is likely, uh, these are likely be charges that are only affordable by academics in wealthier national contexts. So that's another kind of issue, I think, with book processing charges as the uh, primary model for funding open access. And I think there's a, a broad one which isn't perhaps talked about so much, and that is that I think that, well, one of the things I might have argued is that uh, book, processing, book processing charges are stultifying. Uh, they reproduce a thin version of open access, uh, where uh, open access is a kind of benefit not a necessity. It's kind of like an optional extra, a luxury, if you can afford it. Uh, it also entrenches um, business as usual. It entrenches commercial publishing monopolies. And I think perhaps where the book, uh, the Open Book Collective comes in is in relation to a third of those. It's perhaps a failure of imagination, uh, including of infrastructural possibilities. One of the things that we're trying to do is think about, OK, what might the open access book publishing landscape look like if we were to do things um, differently? Uh, but as kind of, um, despite kind of, you know, railing against a little bit the book processing charge, I actually want to sort of um, retain or retrieve something from the notion of a, a book processing charge. And that is, this is kind of where my sociological kind of academic bent kind of comes in. Uh, and that's perhaps to get rid of the, the charge part of the book processing charge. Um, but think about processing. Um, so, you know, there's a whole range of um, work which is interested in, in the social sciences about how we might think of things through forms of process. Think about things, the relations that compose things. And I think that's important and perhaps useful in relation to books. We can think of how we might think of a transformation of a book from a scholarly product um, to thinking much more about the relations that both books both initiate themselves when they're published, but also the relations that books depend on. Uh, and that is where the infrastructures of publishing come to. So we've already heard Tom mentioned, for example, the director of open access books, you know, a fantastic uh, infrastructure that so many um, open access book publishers rely on. Um, but what we're trying to do with the Open Book Collective is think about the infrastructures around funding. How can we reimagine uh, the funding of open access books? Um, making the most uh, of that concept of processing. So that's where we come in, the Open Book Collective. Um, so what are our aims? Well, our aims, uh, the first one is, and perhaps the most important, is uh, we are a revenue generating organisation. Our primary aim is to raise new revenue streams for open access book publishers, uh, but also for open access service providers or infrastructure providers. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to uh, generate new funds uh, for these kinds of organisations. And part of the reason we're doing that is because of our and the fact that we're so uncomfortable with book processing charges. So what we're keen to do specifically with these funds is then support a model of open access book publishing not reliant on book processing charges, or at least not as reliant on the book processing charges. Um, part of the reason, part of the way we try and do that is to make it easier for librarians to subscribe to open access membership schemes. And I'll come on to what those are in a second if you're not familiar with them. Uh, but there's a fourth aim, and I think it's, it's also really, really crucial, and that's a, it's a community building aim, to bring together publishers, service providers, and in particular, those working in academic libraries. One of the things we've been arguing throughout the Coping Project is that the challenges of open access book uh, publishing can only really be addressed uh, collaboratively. And uh, one of the things we're trying to do with the Open Book Collective is to create uh, the possibilities of new forms of collaboration. In terms of what we are doing and what we're, how we're working, we're underpinned by an ethos. Um, we think that open infrastructures are important. Um, if we want a really vibrant, flourishing open access book publishing landscape, we need infrastructures that are genuinely open and that are community driven. Um, 
And that's partly for ethical reasons, but also for financial reasons. If these, if access to the infrastructures that allow books to be distributed and consumed are beyond the price range of individual small publishers, that is a in a kind of uh, has it reinforces those kind of stultifying effects that I was talking about before. The Open Book Collective is a not-for-profit. We're a charity in the process of being registered in the UK. We're community-led. Um, I'll talk about that more in a second. And we're very keen to support a bibliodiversity. Again, a really important ethos for the COPIM project. That means different kinds of publishers, uh, different formats of books, different languages of publishing. We um, are keen to support um, particular publishers in uh, the Anglophone world, but also beyond uh, the Anglophone world, for example. So um, membership programmes, um, uh, I mentioned, and this is important, I think, just to sort of understand it, which I'm sure many of you already do, but for those of you that don't, um, this is a model for funding open access, um, you know, in the round that already exists in the world. So here we have four examples of those kinds of um, programmes, of library membership um, programmes. So one, for example, run by the publisher, uh, which is on the first uh, hexagon there, uh, Punctum Books. Punctum Books has run a very successful library membership program for a number of years now, uh, as has a second publisher uh, uh, in the second hexagon, that's open book publishers. In both cases, this involves an individual publisher approaching a library for financial support. Now, that's not financial support for individual books, but it's financial support for them as an organization. Um, so the library subscribes to the library membership program for a term, usually, you know, between a, it could be a 12 month term, it could be a two year or a three year term and commits to fund that organization for the duration of that term uh, at a level um, uh, provide uh, a level specified by the organization. Um, so this this model already exists and both in both publishers cases that have been very successful in generating a sustainable funding route for their publishing operations. Uh, there are others. Um, we have the opening of future re revenue model, which is part of COPIM, for example. Uh, this involves a very similar model. Uh, it involves, in this case, university presses approaching libraries for support. In their case, they also offer an additional benefit of um, for those subscribers that support the programme, that these university presses um, provide access to a otherwise closed backlist. And then the funding from that library membership programme goes to fund uh, open access uh, publication on the front list. We also have membership programs being offered by existing infrastructure providers or service providers. So DOAB OAPEN has a membership program, exactly the same model, going to libraries predominantly um, and asking them to support them as an organization uh, for a specified term. Uh, so this model already exists in the world out there. And I think what we're trying to do with the Open uh, Book Collective is to think about how we might, how we might scale this. Um, so to really understand how this works, uh, um, I'm going to take you on a quick tour of our site. Um, this is the Open Book Collective website. You can visit it uh, now. Um, and I'm just going to take you around it. Uh, Tom, please tell me if you can't uh, see uh, this. So it's our yes. site. And I'm going to take you straight into the, I suppose, the kind of key area, if you imagine that you're a librarian and you're looking to support um, some different OA initiatives that we have on our site. Um, offering library membership programs, because this is what our site does. And I'll start here actually on this tab. We have a number of different initiatives uh, on our site and that are offering uh, subscription programs, library membership programs available um, to support by a, uh, a library. I mean, it doesn't have to be a library, it could be another institution, but I think the primary target market here is academic um, libraries. So you can add these individual um, you can add these individual um, library membership offerings to a uh, kind of quotation basket to build a price for supporting one or more different library membership programs. But what we also do is we group these library membership programs together into what we call packages. These are groupings. So you can see here, for example, this scholar led grouping, scholar led package has a library membership programs of uh, six different initiatives. Um, and the Open Book Collective uh, package, that involves supporting everything on the platform, 
um, has library membership programs for all the initiatives on the platform. We also have a service providers package, for example. Uh, we're expanding the number of uh, initiatives that are, have packages on the platform at the moment. We have a number that are, uh, have applied and are being considered by our um, by our um, membership application and team, for example. So this will grow um, over time. Um, and it's worth saying that so we have these different uh, library membership programs on the platform. Um, from the what the librarian can do is then they can go and examine the different offerings from the different initiatives. There's clear, consistent information about things like how many publications they have published per year and the cost of production, the subject areas they work in, and also information about latest publications. I'll come on to that uh, in a second, uh, potentially. Um, there's further info in each uh, initiative about the mission and values of different initiatives, their governance structures, for example. And then there's pricing. All uh, initiatives on the platform have tiered pricing. Uh, varies by different country, which depending on the tiering system that a country uses, and then have um, uh, pricing for different uh, regions. And there's also custom pricing available for other regions not covered, for example, in this table. It's really important to say that the pricing for different initiatives uh, is the pricing for initiatives is, is set by initiatives. It's not set by us. Um, we, as an organization, vet the pricing schemes for each uh, initiative to ensure that they're fairly priced, but it's really important, a really important principle that these that this pricing is set by the uh, initiative. Publishers vary hugely in terms of their cost structure, in terms of how they're financed and so on. So for in terms of the pricing of these library membership packages, there is no algorithm uh, that we provide um, uh, as the Open Book Collective. Rather, we invite publishers to propose a pricing model, then we assess whether that's fair based on the information that they provide to us. I'll take you around some other areas of the site uh, in due course, but that's the kind of um, that is the central uh, part um, of the site involving the uh, the the creation creation of a, of a price for supporting one uh, or more different library membership uh, uh, program for a set period of time. Uh, currently, all our contract lengths are one year, uh, but of course you can support them for longer um, if you wish. So what are the benefits for uh, if you're a library or an institution looking to support initiatives via this platform? Well, first, it acts to, to aggregate. So it acts as the platform we've created acts as a membership package aggregator and discovery portal. Uh, it helps understand the relevance um, of these different uh, initiatives to you, to your organization. Um, so we provide consistent information on the subject for, um, foci of different uh, initiatives initiatives and the, uh, the librarian can also browse uh, the catalog as I'll come on to uh, 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 in a second. We conduct due diligence. So um, if you're a library looking to support library membership programs and you're being approached by lots of different initiatives with these kinds of programs, it can be unclear as to uh, the provenance of some of these initiatives. We have a, a membership panel that scrutinizes information provided by all initiatives wanting to be on the platform, ensuring that they have appropriate peer review practice, um, appropriate and uh, transparent governance procedures, and that the pricing and the business model um, is, is, is appropriate and is fair. It also uh, reduces uh, workload. So rather than having to, oh, you're no longer screen sharing. Just... Yeah, okay. just to check if you're having slides there still, Joe, because I yes. cannot see him on the- I do have slides, I do have slides. Screen. Right. There we go. You see that now? See. Yeah, there we are. Perfect. There we go. Sorry, aggregation. Um, and then workflow. So it, it also means that rather than having to manage the library membership program, let's say 10 different initiatives with different contracting processes, different procurement processes, um, different payment dates, um, you can potentially uh, manage them all via a single uh, via, via a single organization. So that's the advantages for libraries for other supporting institutions. And then for uh, publishers or service providers, again, um, we uh, make the work involved in uh, in creating and managing a library membership program, we hugely reduce the workload involved. So we manage the invoicing process on behalf of publishers, we manage the contracting process. And the key thing here is that this makes offering membership programs possible for even the smallest publisher. And that would include, for example, my publisher, Matching Press. Um, you know, for years, 
libraries have been a complete black box to us. We have been fairly successful at, you know, uh, creating a sustainable business model through the charging of, of uh, book processing charges or fees. We've never had to charge an individual academic, but we have charged institutions and grants and so on. Uh, but libraries have been a black box for us. There's no way that we could create a library membership program and go to a library and ask them for support. We simply don't have the capacity to do that. And also we're so small, it doesn't really make sense. You know, we publish between three and five books a year. But if we're bundled together as part of a package with other small publishers, suddenly that becomes something more viable. And we also don't, you know, as a, as a, a matching my small press, we don't um, have the knowledge as well how to go about the process of dealing with the contracting process, dealing with the invoicing process and the payment flows. Open Book Collective takes all of that on on behalf of publishers and service providers. The second key thing is that we do is we then undertake the outreach on behalf of our initiatives. We do that work of contacting libraries, contacting institutions and talking to them about the work that we're doing. That's something that we're doing at the moment. And the reception we've had so far has been extremely positive, um, I must say, uh, from libraries. So it's really exciting to be having a series of meetings uh, with them, setting up and talking to them about the kind of work that we're doing. The idea ultimately is that this will then generate a new income stream enabling publishers to help them transition away from a reliance on book processing charges. With each of the publishers, we've worked um, through a pricing model that enables them to really begin to transition away from a reliance on book processing charges. At the same time, for service providers, for infrastructure providers, we provide them with a new, uh, new income stream. Um, and, um, and the key thing for service providers is that by putting service providers alongside publishers, it makes it a far easier sell to libraries when we're trying to articulate why it's so important not just to, su just to support content uh, produced by publishers, but also to support the infrastructures of publishing uh, that we all as publishers uh, rely on. Other important things to note, the running costs um, our running costs are shared between publishers and service providers on the one hand and libraries on the other hand. There are opportunities for um, anybody with a financial stake in the Open Book Collective to, to become involved in governance. Um, what that means is you don't have to become involved in governance. Some people simply don't have the time, the capacity to do that. But if you want to, we have a governance structure. It means you can be actively involved in the ongoing governance of, uh, of, of our work. We have a board of stewards. Those board of stewards are ultimately answerable to our to our members, and the members are the people who have opted to become involved in in governance. Publishers and service providers also contribute to what we call a collective development fund. This is actually really important to understand. So we are a charity; we're a not for profit, and as part of that, we are also going to be a grant issuer, an issuer of small grants probably, but a grant issuer nonetheless. And what we will be doing through this collective development fund is putting out calls that uh, publishers or infrastructure providers who want to build capacity, maybe they want to get going, maybe there's some project that they want to work on, um, they can then apply to our collective development fund for, for funding, for seed funding to get going. All financial information, uh, including our revenue and our fees and so on is reported openly and transparently. Now, I know that some of you probably have some questions about fees, so I think it's important to be absolutely clear about those. So I'm just going to take you through a, ca a case study of one of the publishers on our platform, which is Open Book Publishers, and explain how the fee structure um, works. So if you go onto their um, fee page on their library membership program page, you will see a box that looks like this. This is their fee uh, structure. It's tiered. We have generally have three tiers on the Open Book Collective. Now, how those tiers are composed varies by different national contexts because some people, different countries use different systems. Um, so, for example, um, in the UK, we use the uh, JISC banding system. In Canada, use the um, CKRN banding system. And in other contexts, we use different banding systems, sometimes based on FTE, um, for example. But let's just focus for the sake of simplicity on the UK. So those are the fees for the UK. So for, the, uh, for tier one institutions, for larger, wealthier institutions, the fee for supporting the Open Book Collective via the, uh, um, uh, sorry, the fee for supporting Open Book Publishers via um, the Open Book Collective is, is, is £700 per year uh, for the top tier institutions and £300 for the lower tier, lowest tier institutions. Let's just take the top tier institutions, for example. So if we imagine that um, uh, a, a large institution wants to support open book publishers via our platform, their subscription fee uh, is 700 pounds for 12 months. 
To that, we add a support processing fee of 5% to institutions. So that means that we invoice the, that institution a total of £735. That processing fee income goes to fund our day-to-day -day running costs. So that's what we invoice uh, the, the library uh, for the 12-month period. How then, does the, how then does the income then flow to the publisher themselves? So if you imagine that from their perspective, so, you know, they've, we have that £700 subscription income. Um, so bearing in mind that the processing fee goes entirely to cover our operating costs, leaving that £700. So that £700 subscription income, we then charge a processing fee to providers of 5%. So that means £35 uh, comes out of this uh, income. We're saying that it's generally 5%. The only exception to that is in year one, where it's 7.5%. But just for the sake of simplicity, let's focus on the 5% fee, which is chargeable from years two onwards. Uh, that's 5%. And that, again, goes towards covering our running costs. And then we have the, our collective development fund fee of 5%. Um, this goes straight to our collective development fund, our grant issuing uh, fund. So that means that the total transferred to the initiative um, is 630 uh, pounds. Again, bear in mind that these fees are set by the initiatives. Uh, we advise them, we get discussion about them with these fees, but the fees are set by the initiatives. Okay, I wanted to go on to one more uh, feature of our platform that's quite interesting and I think worth talking about. In a way, it's kind of separate from the offering um, of uh, library membership um, programs and subscription programs. Uh, oh, I should say as well, from the library's perspective, what they get in return for supporting uh, this is they, of course, get you know, the publicity and uh, we uh, acknowledge their thanks and the uh, providers all acknowledge um, uh, the support on their websites and so on. And then it varies. Um, but largely, often what many initiatives say is we'll provide you an annual report, we'll show you where your money is going, we'll show that this is going towards supporting um, open access publishing. Some publishers also offer individual benefits of, for example, the print copy costs of hard copies. And there are other things that, um, for example, Open Book Publishers offers um, access to some of the other formats that they offer uh, for, um, um, for members of that institution, for example, via an IP address range. But moving then on to this other feature of our platform, and that is our collective catalogue. So um, in the back end of our platform, we use uh, the Tote Open Metadata platform that I mentioned at the very beginning. This is a platform that allows publishers to much more easily manage their metadata and export it to a range of different places. Uh, publishers don't have to use the to open, to open metadata platform, but we, we encourage them to do so. And the reason we encourage them, we, what we say to them is that if you do, what will happen is your books will feature in our collective catalogue. This is actually an early uh, draft of our collective catalogue page. I'm just going to go to the uh, live version now. So this is our collective catalogue. So what this, what's happening here is that um, this collective catalogue is pulling book metadata from the tote metadata um, platform. Let's just focus on open book publishers again. I'll just filter by them. So here we have their books, for example. This is being pulled from the tote open metadata platform. Uh, and one of the nice things that this allows us to do is it allows us to put um, the catalogues of a range of different initiatives in one place and, and create a kind of collective catalog. But then the publisher can, the librarian can also then filter by individual publisher. And then they can click on individual books, see when they're published and the license and so on. I uh, can even uh, export the metadata uh, direct from uh, our site. Again, this is all pulled directly from the Tote metadata um, uh, management platform. So quite a nice feature uh, as, part, as part of our site. OK, I wanted to say a few words about next steps. Uh, Tom at the beginning mentioned the Open Book Futures project. Um, it's, it's kind of get a bit confusing in this space. We have open book publishers, open book collective, um, the open uh, futures revenue, open book, uh, the open, opening the future revenue model. And then we actually have separately the open book futures uh, project. And this is actually a new project, um, which has just been announced. It's been a long time in the making. For a long time, we weren't uh, able to talk about it in public, but we're really pleased to be able to um, uh, confirm with everyone that we have now uh, received funding for a major new project. The coping project is coming to an end, it ends at the end of this month. And the Open Book Futures project will follow directly on from the coping project, starting on the 1st of May. Uh, the budget is, uh, of five, is 5.1 million uh, pounds, co-funded again by Arcadia and by the Research England um, Development Fund. 
Uh, I should say, so I'm the PI um, and um, got a range of different partners working on that project. And the project has a range of different objectives, again, around metadata, around archiving, around accessibility. There's a new there's a new work package around accessibility. So making sure that, you know, books aren't just technically accessible. They are actually accessible to whoever needs to access them, whatever their needs uh, may be. Uh, and that, that's really exciting to be working on. Uh, but one of the key things it's also allowing us to do is to really expand the work of the Open Book Collective. And here are some of the things that we'll be doing as part of that project. So we'll be extending our outreach work uh, within both within uh, Anglophone context uh, and uh, but also crucially beyond. Um, so within uh, different European countries, for example, but also beyond uh, also to, to so we're thinking about one of the things, the key things we're thinking about in this project with our partners is how can we actually involve uh, libra libraries and publishers and infrastructure providers, um, not in kind of the business as usual countries and countries that are um, less financially privileged. How can we actually involve them in a meaningful way in what we're doing? That's one of the key areas of work for the project. We'll also, be, because one of the things that we will be doing as part of the project is immediately uh, be getting going on our grant giving program via the Collective Development Fund. So the funders have actually given us funding that we can put directly into our Collective Development Fund, which means that we'll be able to, um, once we've developed the appropriate governance structures and application procedures and so on, we'll be able to immediately get going on issuing grants via the Collective Development Fund to, to build um, capacity within the open access book publishing uh, world. A range of other things, platform enhancements, multilingual support, uh, a new information hub uh, for publishers and infrastructure providers who are looking to, to scale up their work. A range of different partners involved uh, in the Open Book Collective's work. Here are um, just um, some of them working with us to engage with libraries and publishers and infrastructure providers in a range of um, different uh, contexts. If you want to follow our work, um, uh, we can put the link to our mailing list in the chat. I guess it's probably easier than scanning the QR code. And you can also, of course, follow um, us on Twitter. So, yeah, I hope that was of interest. And um, Judith and I are really happy to answer you know, any questions that you might have. Great. I've lost the window. We've got quite a few in the chat. Indeed. So, um, yeah, thanks very much, Joe, for this um, this presentation and uh, sharing quite a lot about the Open Book Collective, the Open Book Futures Project and COPIM and the many other things. Uh -huh. As Judith said, we have quite a few questions in the chat. Um, and I'll just begin at, at the top uh, and then maybe you or, or Judith could um, yeah, speak to uh, to the questions. So, uh, the first question there is from David Watson about the, the price ranging. And um, he, I think he's curious about what the price range uh, signifies or what it depends on. Is that the size of the institution or how is that kind of defined? Yeah. Um, and please correct me or, or interrupt me by unmuting David if I'm, if I'm wrong there. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so it uh, varies, as I mentioned, it varies by national context. So um, we use, for example, in the UK, the GISC banding system. The GISC banding system is a, uh, for, this is for institutions in the UK. For institutions in the UK, we use the GISC banding system. Um, and that banding effectively does reflect the size or the, uh, the I suppose, the wealth of different institutions. So this is a system um, that uh, just was created to categorize institutions according to size and you know affordability and it's used for a range of different things you know for journal subscriptions and so on but we're using we're piggybacking onto that system in other contexts we use different um, systems so um, we use as I mentioned in Canada the CKRN system but we often also use um, straight FTE um, so um, student uh, as far as I understand it's student numbers um, within an institution so in that case that does reflect the size of an institution the idea is of course that um, a large institution is, is usually able has a larger budget than a smaller institution so in that sense it does reflect the size of institutions and it's not we don't we there, we have a slightly more complex system for example for the EU uh, because simple simple FTE doesn't always it doesn't work in you know in in some EU countries are not as wealthy as others so we have it on, laid on top of that a, a, um, a World Bank income classification um, that also then takes into account the uh, the wealth of that country in which the institution is located and um, so it does vary by uh, by different uh, contexts. Great, thank you. And then we have um, the next question from uh, Martin Wolf who asks uh, whether the Open Book Collective can be thought of as a book specific version of uh, of SCOS, uh, which 
is the Global Sustainability Coalition of Open Science Services. Um, yeah, I really like that question. So we have Spark uh, Europe involved, you know, in the partner in the Open Book Futures project, and we've been talking to them about um, and Scott and so on. And one of the things that we are really keen to work with them uh, about on the new project is thinking about yeah how, what we can learn from them because they've been doing you know this similar as you you know as you intimate some similar work in very very different contexts. Um, I'm not an expert on SCOS, but as far as I understand things, SCOS is largely aimed at sort of um, larger institutions and, as you say, not necessarily just books. So, yeah, there are some similarities uh, in, in terms of what we're doing. Obviously, we are we do have this grant giving pilot as well, which, you know, is a specific grant giving fund. But one of the things is it's interesting, I think, to think about publishers, not just as content providers, but themselves uh, infrastructures. Publishers are publishing infrastructure. They create the infrastructure possibilities that allow books to exist. So in, in that sense, yes, the, uh, the supporting institutions, supporting libraries are supporting the infrastructure of publishing. They're not necessarily supporting individual content uh, uh, produced by that publisher. They're trusting that the publisher, you know, based on their track record, is going to be producing you know, relevant and high quality content in the future. And they're saying we're going to support you as an organization because of your past track record and because your you know uh, your governance structures and peer review practices are are in you know, are in place so in that sense we have very similar aims as cost and it's supporting capacity and, and infrastructural capacity you know into the medium term um i'm not i probably didn't fully answer your question because i think i need to understand the details of the SCOS program more fully to fully be able to answer that question but certainly we're sharing many aims yeah thank you maybe i, I could Briefly add, uh, as we as uh, Awaken and the DOAB are, uh, have been part of, or are still part of, of SCOS and have completed our SCOS campaign and are now part of the Open Book uh, Collective. And I think there, uh, for us, what is uh, very helpful there is, I think it serves similar aims, but I think with the Open Book Collective, very much focused on, on the book realm. And with SCOS, it has really been about kind of this uh, kickstart funding or really helping us to um, receive funding support to maintain our operations and to help us um, yeah, maintain the organizations. Uh, however, after that uh, period, after the campaign has been completed, which is where we are now, um, we are expected to continue on our own or in partnership with other initiatives, such as the Open Book Collective, where there can be also more continued support, not just for a one or two or three year period, but also longer over time in the future. Um, and I think for, for us as an infrastructure, specifically for books, uh, it's very helpful to see there are uh, different initiatives around who um, not only um, kind of uh, bring attention to this, but also really try to zoom in on the services that are being offered and the value that they provide to the, the wider community. Um, and then there are a few questions a bit more specific on the, I think the, the details. So there's one question from Leah on the, on the contract. Uh, and I would presume it's a contract for, for libraries uh, that sign up. What are that's always uh, 12 months or what is kind of uh, common there? Yeah. So, um, at the moment we have our default setting that the contract is 12 months, but as you kind of perhaps are getting a, a Lee there, some libraries want to support for longer uh, and there may be sometimes you know good reasons why they might might want to support for a longer period so for example they have a budget that they know they want to um spend for as i say a three-year period of support of course you know we're very happy to uh we're very happy to we just have actually with a um, with a university i probably can't quite say who it is just now because it's not invoice and so on but um, a very prominent university here in the uk that wants to support for for three uh for three years and of course, you know, we're very happy to do that. I think, uh, and actually, one, that's actually one of the things that we want a bit of feedback on. Um, so if you have any thoughts on that, really welcome. We, um, our current rationale is to start with a, a default contract of 12 months because we're a new initiative um, and people don't know us. Um, and so we're starting with a year and that's some of the feedback we've got. They, like, they want to, you know, they want to support perhaps many institutions want to support for a year um, and then see how things go and then renew uh, in due course. And by the way, I did mention that our fees that we take from publishers and service providers are higher in the first year, 7.5% rather than 5%. The reason for that is um, we know from library membership programs that it's much more difficult to get a library support in the first year and that they then often renew. So the costs to get the library support for the first time are a bit higher and that slightly higher fee uh, is reflective of that. 
Yeah, thank you. And anyone feel free to to unmute or Ali if you want to add something um, to the question. Uh, yeah, and then we have uh, a couple of questions here from from Eric. Eric, you're also always very free to unmute, but I'll, I'll begin with the, the first one. And I think, Joe, you can maybe other also follow on on the other ones that are in the chat. Yes. Um, and the first one is, what if a library thinks the price is too high? Will you uh, still take the money? And which payment methods do you take? And if you send invoices? And um, also a question on which countries you operate in. Yes. And then there's also one about how much money we secured. I'm happy to take as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, so what do the library think? Well, okay, for a start, they don't obviously, you know, we understand library budgets are, you know, uh, not always rosy. It's a tough time for, for many libraries. We can, uh, you know, if we had maybe more time, I mean, I, I'd be, I think it's an interesting question to think about, you know, what happens if these kind of models scale? And that's often the question that we get, you know, how sustainable is, is this kind of model? And I think, you know, in the medium term, um, we and we and other organisations doing something similar, you know, need to make a collective case for, libraries be thinking about how their budgets are used um, and I think that's already happening in some cases um, but yeah but for, for now anyway um, um, library budgets are of, of course constrained um, and the first thing to say is they don't have to support everything on the platform there are ways in which they can select a smaller number of things to support you know things that are really relevant to their priorities we you know really encourage libraries where possible to support all the initiatives on our platform because we think that's really good for the for the open access book publishing world. However, of course, you know, if they can't support everything, there might be some smaller things that they might consider. Um, there might also be ways in which the tiering, um, the default tiering structure that we use isn't doesn't work. It doesn't really reflect the realities of their institution. So we're not completely rigid about that. You know, just because a university is categorized as tier one, but they think in actual fact they can make a case that really they should be considered a tier two or a tier three organization, of course we're happy to happy to entertain that. So of course, you know, we are there is some flexibility um, there and we can talk to individual institutions um, about that. In terms of the practicalities, payment methods, yes, we send invoices. Um, we I think can take credit cards, everyone's been paying so far and directly uh, by bank transfer, we, um, also um, checks. We understand that some US institutions, for example, uh, prefer paying by check and that, that should be possible. Which countries do we operate in? Um, so our, our outreach work at the moment is primarily focusing on the UK and the US. And that's just for pragmatic reasons. That's where we've got some really good networks and that's where we're starting, but there's no reason why we would just constrain our work to those countries. And um, we've already had, um, we just had a uh, Finnish university wanting to um, support an initiative um, via our platform, for example. So um, so potentially, you know, we would operate anywhere where we think there are libraries um, that might be interested in um, supporting uh, library membership programs on our, on our platform. Shall I go ahead and answer the next question? Tom, how much funding have we secured? So um, we launched in mid-December um, and um, the part of the reason we launched then is because we wanted to really road test our platform. Um, so we launched, it was a relatively soft launch and we were getting feedback from our publishers, from, um, from libraries about our platform. And then we started our outreach about four weeks ago. Um, we've already raised approximately, I think it's 40,000 pounds with commitments taking us up to around 60, 70,000 pounds. Um, we are aiming by the end of the the the, the open book um, uh, open uh, book futures project to get uh, to a far higher number, um, getting you know above five hundred thousand pounds in annual revenue passing through the uh, the platform uh, to generate the revenue that we that we know that we need um, to sustain uh, the open book collective into the medium term. Uh, our kind of like you know our ideal case is that we get up to a million uh, pounds in revenue by the end of the uh, open book futures project on an annual basis so 200 libraries supporting at an average of five thousand um, pounds per year that would be the kind of revenue that we're aiming to get uh, to get to and that we do think is realistic if ambitious um can i okay. just quick, quickly ask yeah. you and when uh just for, for people to have an idea of that when would that be again the end of the the open book futures or when that would be april wanna... 2026 end of april okay. 2026 so we have some time still to uh, oh to yeah three that. years sorry <laughs> three years. i should be clear about that yeah i've just been so wrapped up in this project yeah so it's a three-year project just like the copen the copen project was a three-year project it was extended we got uh, because of the covid pandemic um but then um, this project is a three-year project as well great and then we have uh, another question from leah on the on the press side and the question is whether all the presses involved are uh, fully away mm -hmm. and whether we're not looking at a fee reduction here. I'm, I'm not really sure if I 
so there's that there's no other fee incurred should our offers use the press as supported so indeed it's a fully away press i think that's probably coming from a perspective of a library and lee i don't know if you feel free to you know unmute yourself and um, uh, and clarify i imagine that's coming from the perspective of a library so for example is there a um is there a fee reduction is there a, a book processing fee reduction for if the, if the a, if an institution supports a um, publisher on via platform so let me just say a word about that so um as things stand so we have uh, we have membership criteria and we can post a link actually to those membership criteria uh in the chat in due course um so we have membership criteria um for um which delimit the kinds of presses and infrastructure providers that can uh, offer a membership um, package on the platform and one of those membership right so we have uh, for publishers we have two broad sets of um, groups that we are uh, talking to one is what we call sort of born away or uh, presses so these are diamond open access presses that means their books all of their books uh, both front and back lists are open access and they publish in a, pu in a purely open access way uh, on the front list so of course you know and for i think all of the publishers uh, in that group on our platform, there's no, um, there is no um, mandatory book processing charge uh, anyways. As I mentioned, um, what many of the publishers do is they say, look, if you're an author and you have access to funding, you know, fantastic, you know, it really support, helps support, uh, uh, really helps us as a press. And, you know, we were happy to invoice for those, for those fees. But if you don't, we will still um, publish your book you know, or consider your proposal uh, nonetheless. So in that sense, there's no, um, there was no BBC anyway. Uh, and then the second group of publishers are what we call hybrid presses. These are presses that um, may not be fully open access at the moment, but they, uh, they want to become predominantly open access publishers. So what we say is we need you to commit and put forward a business model to get to a stage of being 75% open access on your front list. That doesn't mean you have to be there right now, but there needs to be a realistic uh, roadmap to get towards that uh, that that stage. And that that should and probably will include revenue from the Open Book Collective. So it's a chicken and egg situation. We're not saying you have to make a sort of a, a, a commitment to get seventy five percent, you know, independent of income from Open the Open Book Collective. We're saying that if you know we deliver you the income that we think is realistic, that you then transition your front list to being at least seventy five percent open access um, on the front list. Um, so then if the question is, so what does that mean for um, authors from my institution? Um, in all, I think in all the cases, um, they should be able to publish anyway uh, on an open access basis uh, via the publishers um, on the Open Book um, Collective. What I would probably be saying to you as a, a, a librarian, and what, one of the things that's actually really nice about the tote metadata that we have is we can actually look through the publisher catalogues of those publishers that use tote and say, not, and we have a particular field in that tote metadata field, which is institutional affiliation. We can say, um, look, your institution in the past, this number of authors have published in the collective catalogue of publishers on the Open Book Collective. And what I would probably be saying to you as a librarian is, you know, um, if you have publishers, if you have authors, sorry, if you have students, sorry, if you have researchers who might be interested in publishing in the kinds of publishers that we have uh, uh, featured on uh, offering membership programs on the Open Book Collective, um, and maybe even we have um, some of your past researchers who have published in the Open Book Collective group in the past, this shows the importance of supporting this kind of publisher um, for your institution. Hopefully that helps you make a case for supporting the publishers on the Open Book Collective um, up the chain within your institution because you're able to demonstrate the relevance um, of these uh, publishers to, to your research, your staff body. I hope that does answer Lee I'd like to know I'd be curious to know if that answers your uh, if your question if that answers your question yeah also feel free to just uh, follow yeah. up in, in the chat um, whatever is preferred um, then I see there's one more question there uh, for now from David Watson uh, on the OBC and technical expectations and whether the OBC has any technical expectations of the publishers and initiatives using the OBC um, such as digital preservation policy sustainability these kinds of expectations that's actually a really fantastic question and i actually can't remember what precisely is in our membership criteria about that i'm happy to confess you can have a look at the membership criteria around that i mean so just to answer in a bit more of a general way um and um so preservation is a really important part of what we're doing within the coping project and the open book futures project so i mentioned that at the beginning that we have a specific work package around um preservation and archiving um 
it may well be that we actually should have specific preservation requirements as part of our membership criteria. As far as I remember, we don't currently have specific um, requirements as part of that. Of course, you know, we have our books in total, we have our books in, in directive open access um, books and so on. Um, but certainly, I think that is something that we probably do need to, to think about uh, and be perhaps uh, clear about. So, um, but in terms of other technical expectations, yeah, we have we have we have minimum metadata expectations. For example, for those that use the Tote metadata platform, we're currently working to get everyone's metadata up to let's say a minimum threshold, and actually are going to be publishing a minimum set of expectations in due course. And we don't have that uh, in place at the moment. But yeah, that is for an example of something that we are planning to do uh, in quite in the short term, actually, quite soon, to have a minimum set of metadata uh, expectations, uh, for example. And yeah, I've just dropped a link in the chat to our membership criteria for all members, where you can see the um, requirements of the different kinds of presses, as well as other members. And uh, maybe I can add kind of a related question to that. Is there a um a way for for those libraries to that uh, support some of these publishers and and the programs to also then receive uh those books or to retrieve those um for, for the publishers they support um also kind of in yeah in, in a technical sense yes i mean obviously you know they can that's a really good point actually and that's something we should probably think of we should i mean uh, we within um with the of my colleagues here from tote and they even probably answer this question a little bit better than I can but um, the whole idea of using the tote metadata uh, management platform is that it makes it far easier to import relevant metadata uh, into your library catalogs um, in actual fact I mean one of the things is that of course is metadata is not proprietary anyway so that the metadata can be readily imported into your library catalogs anyway <laughs> irrespective of whether you support the publisher what might be nice I think to actually do is to create a sort of almost like a, almost like a feed a custom feed for those uh, initiatives that you do support that you can just that you can import those into your catalog. Um, but then again, why not? Just, why not? Why not just import, you know, uh, everything in the, the, the tote database? Um, I would say given, given it's open metadata and given these texts are open access in a way, it doesn't necessarily make sense to just limit it to those that you support. But there may be other reasons why you might want to do that. So in that case, a sort of custom feed would make sense. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think Rupert uh, is here from from Todwa. I, if he's here, he please feel free to to add Rupert. But I do indeed believe also from from Tote uh, that it's possible and a way for people to also indeed integrate those books, subsets of books, or or the full um, collection into the the library catalog. Ah, oh, Rupert, um, do you want to speak to that? If you're there. Hi, I am there, but I'm afraid I just missed that question. <laughs> oh, no worries. The question was basically, you know, if if a, if a library supports a publisher via the Open Book Collective, you know, is it possible to download the meta, you know, the, the catalog of that publisher directly into their catalog? And I was sort of saying, well, in a way, it's all open metadata. They can actually just download the whole lot anyway, but there may be specific reasons why the library may only want to, to download the metadata of a specific publisher or a group of right. publishers. <clears throat> Actually, sort of um, pretty exciting news on that. We have we we have just created a Mark 21 outflow for that, uh, which can be filtered by publisher or by title. Um, uh, we've got a Mark XML just on the way as well. So again, uh, for all of the books that, uh, any publisher that is, is uh, in, ingested their, their metadata into into Tote that are part of the OBC. Um, well, any publisher within Tote can get uh, Mark records uh, directly from from uh, from Tote if that's the, what they're after. But also, there's lots of other different formats that Tote is uh, able to generate. And there's an open API. If if they wanted actually to access the API directly, then they can also um, do what the OBC does, which is uh, access the open API. So yeah, all the metadata is open and we've just released uh, Mark records. You can see them on, our, on the Tote website. Um, we're, we are just getting feedback on them now. Um, so any feedback that anybody else wants to throw in is good. So it's a, it's, it's a very much an alpha um, Mark record that we've got out. Uh, so we've made, we haven't made a song and dance about it yet. We're getting some feedback from libraries about how it looks. Um, uh, and uh, we will 
we'll do a, a round of revisions and then get back, um, uh, uh, get, you know, make a, a, a bigger launch of that uh, uh, later on. Great. Thank you, Rupert, for speaking to that. And good to see that there are uh, already ways of getting the, the books into, into the catalog and, and these technical developments. Um, I, I see for now we don't have another question yet in the in the chat, but please feel free to add. We have a few more minutes still. And uh, one uh, question I would like to add um, more on the other side. So you've mentioned, Joe, that there are the plans to further develop the OBC. And of course, we would very much like to see more libraries joining and supporting these programs. Um, but are there also plans to add more uh, publishers or infrastructure providers? And what kind of, yeah, if so, what kind of uh, parties can people maybe expect to see there? Yep. Yeah, yeah. we're in um, active discussion with, um, I think, at least two different new infrastructure providers. So I think that's, you know, uh, I, I you know I probably sh shouldn't mention them by name until everything's confirmed, just um, for sake of proprietary. But, um, but and then similarly with publishers, uh, you know, and that about we're speaking to about another five different publishers at the moment. Um, and uh, there's one publisher that I expect they've applied and I expect the membership um, uh, application to be ratified. Another one that sent an, uh, an application, we wait for their costings and so on. Um, so, yeah, I think over time the group will grow. Um, we're not really in a massive hurry to sort of like radically expand. You know, one of the one of the, the, the you know, it's exciting having an expanding group of publishers. That also means that the price uh, goes up, right? Because it's a cumulative model. Uh, so the price was supporting everything. The more initiatives you have on the platform, the, the price will go up. And it will um, sometimes for some institutions that'll be fine, but for some they'll then have to make choices about what they want to support. Um, but yeah, we I think most concerned to, to have the right publishers and to make sure that they are you know they meet our membership criteria uh, and are also invested in the open book collective you know that this is a collaborative endeavor it's a collaborative, it's a collaborative experiment so yeah i imagine in the coming years we will see um, a steady increase in the number of publishers and infrastructure providers um, on on the platform and the membership criteria means that not all publishers it's not suitable you know for all publishers um and that's fine you know there are there are many different ways of supporting open access books and we're particularly focused on, um, you know, born away presses and on um, hybrid presses that are really committed to open access. Um, there are other models um, for uh, different ways of working, and that's fine. I think that's one of the things, you know, we don't want to be the platform um, that, you know, the, you know, the one platform to rule them all. Um, um, there are many different ways of uh, supporting uh, and doing open access. And I suppose that's one of the things that we're trying to argue for, bibliodiversity, Infrastructural diversity. Uh, of course, we'd probably say it'd be great if that infrastructural diversity was underpinned by open infrastructures, you know, community-led infrastructures, and so on. Can I just say a quick word? You know, yes, you know, if there's anybody from libraries um, here that is interested in, in talking to us about what we're doing in more detail, then please. Uh, the way we probably I would recommend that we work is that you know, if you drop us an email, uh, let us know, and then we can uh, arrange a meeting and talk to you in much more detail about what we're about what we're doing. Um, and there was another question there about German uh, supporters. Um, we're currently, uh, we haven't uh, had a, a support yet from Germany. We haven't actually actively conducted any outreach yet in Germany. That's one of the aims of the new project, actually, is to really make sure we fully understand the German context before we just kind of like, you know, blunder in. Um, but there are a few individual libraries um, that we know uh, we already have relationships with that we're already talking to. So, yeah, I would expect us to be able to announce our, actually, oh, no. We've already announced a Dutch supporter, but not a German supporter. Great. Thank you, Joe, um, also for taking the last question there. And in, in the interest of time, I would like to yeah close the, the session. Um, but before that, I would like to just uh, indeed repeat what Joe said and what Lucy posted in the chat. For any library, publisher, or infrastructure provider, or just anyone interested in the OBC, please feel free to reach out to Joe and the team uh, directly afterwards. And there will also be an opportunity uh, to meet uh, with Joe and more COPIM colleagues next week for those attending the UKSG conference where there will be a COPIM stand with more information about the OBC um, and um, yeah, also an opportunity to, to chat in person about all things open access books for anyone attending. Um, so yeah, with that, I would like to thank you all for attending today, for your questions. Uh, and then, yeah, very much looking forward to seeing more from the Open Book Collective in the coming years and to see which libraries and, and initiatives uh, will join and hopefully will also thrive.
Thanks so much. Thanks very much for inviting us here to, to talk to you all. So thanks everyone. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll close the meeting and the recording will also be available on our, our YouTube channel. And yeah, we hope to see you again uh, sometime uh, soon. Have a great Thank day. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.